Okay. All right. I think it's recording. So, um, last time we talked about reading in data and um, encountered a couple different data scenarios embodied by these ant folders. Um, I thought I'd uh, walk you through one um, data importing scenario that typically would be a bit of a headache um, and how you'd sort of try to troubleshoot that. Um, and then we're going to get into data wrangling, so putting data into different shapes and trying to subset it and things like that. So it's the ant3 that we want to deal with. Um, oh, no, it's not. That's something different. Ah, that is also something I need to do. So, so ant2, we haven't done this as a project yet, so I'm going to say new project. Um, in an existing directory. Oh, I have to browse to that directory. Where is it on my computer? Um, it's going to be teaching and int2. Okay. So create project. So it'll, I guess, reopen our studio in that directory, setting the working directory. Uh, so we can see that there's that new file there. I'll also start up a new file for my script. And I'll immediately save it. So I'll call it ant2 analysis. OK, so um, the tools that we'll need are mostly in the tidyverse uh, package. So I'll run that right away. Uh, but let's go take a look at these data files. So it's similar to what we had before, um, where there seems to be a file per participant in some experiment that we might have run. Um, unfortunately, this experiment was run in a manner that yields some pretty ugly data output. So um, before we could just use read uh, CSV or read um, TSV on each of these files, and they would read in just fine. Let's actually click on one and take a look at it. Um, I'm going to make it bigger and this bigger. So I've got some extra stuff here. Before, the files just started with like a header row. Now these files have some useless information here. So we need to figure out how to skip that useless information. Additionally, if we scroll down, got lots of nice looking data. Oh, and there's some other. It seems to be that if you notice, this one is like in this block column, it's all ones. And then there's a big break and some useless stuff. And then it repeats the header info. And you've got block two here. And then, oh, it breaks again. So this is a messy data file that um, you want to try to avoid. Part of uh, going through trying to read this in is going to be an exercise in uh, teaching you guys why you want to make your experiments such that they produce nice clean data files so they're easy to read in. But uh, you will, it's also to teach you that um, it's just a little bit of work to handle situations like these and to give you the tools to handle that. So um, clearly that data import wizard isn't really going to work so well. Um, we could try it. Let's go file import data set from CSV. And we'll say browse and grab just one of those files. Doesn't matter which one. They're all identical. Um, we have to tell it the delimiter is a tab. And but it's still not looking good. Um, skip. That's a good option here. Uh, there's one, two. If I say skip equals two, what happens? Uh, oh, it seems that I need to put the number of like actual lines to skip. So there's four lines. There's a line with something on it, then a blank line, then a line with something on it, then a blank line, and then the header. So that's four in total. And there we go. I start getting the right header. Um, 
I happen to know though that this is not going to start work. This is going to fail once we get to exactly once you get past that first little bit. So happily, this data set happens to be structured because I didn't want to make things too complicated for you guys, such that each block here has exactly 48 trials, 48 lines. So that's not something that's in these options. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go back to um, looking in this import data wizard. It's going to give us some ideas as to what we need to do to read this in, but I'm not going to bother copying all this because there's actually quicker code that I can use. So let's try to read in just that first little bit. So um, I'll say, uh, I'll create an object called A because it's right under my pinky finger. I'll say read, oh, I'll um, use the reader package and read uh, TSV. TSV means that we don't have to tell it it's tab delimited. It will just assume it's tab delimited. Uh, the file we want is in the data folder and it's ant sub, will it autocomplete? Yes. I just hit, I started typing it and I hit tab as I was typing it and, oops, so ant, and it give, the GUI is smart enough to know that I'm looking for a file in a folder called data, so it lists all the files there that start with ant, so that's awesome. All right, so um, I do wanna add that skip argument. So skip equals four. Um, let's actually look at the help for read TSV to um, see what other arguments we might use. So this is a common reading help page for both read CSV, read delim, and read TSV. Um, the one that I want is... There's an argument called nmax, and that's telling you how many rows maximum to read in. You can see that down here in the uh, description, maximum number of records to be read, where a record is a, a row. So if we put nmax oops, equals 48, I think I said was the total. Let's try this a little bit back over, run that. We get the standard output from read TSV that it gives us a summary of what it guessed for each column. Um, but otherwise, no errors or warnings. Let's uh, say view A to bring it up in here. And it's read in all the columns as we wanted. And it read in all 48 entries there. All right, so we successfully got the first chunk out of this file. Let's try to get the second chunk. Create something, I'll just copy that code. And I'll instead call it B. Now, I want nmax to be the same because each chunk is gonna be the same size. So if I bring this back over and show you, first chunk was 48 entries, the second chunk was 48 entries, third chunk is 48 entries, etc. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna change the nmax entry. But I do need to change this skip entry. So what should I change it to? Okay, so it's skipping 56. So how did you get that? Well there's four at the beginning of that one. Yep. And then there's gonna be four in the middle. Oh, okay. So okay, so it's yeah. Right? The first four, and then the next 48, and then the four that start this one. Okay, let's see if that works. All right, oh, problems. So, oh, it's actually given us a little bit of a karst with columns, best that this is a useless line. Uh-oh, something's gone awry here. So let's uh, take a look at this file again. So at the very beginning, there's one, two, three, four, 
that we would want to skip. And then there's 48 that we would also want to skip. Um, oh, I guess 49, because there's this row. OK, so that gets us to 53 that we'd want to skip. Um, oh, and there's also one, two, three extra ones here. OK, so let's see. There was the first four, and then the one header, and then 48, and then how many did I say was right before that? Three. Three, and then finally another four. Do you want the heading for the next block? So it will automatically go one. It will automatically, yeah, start reading at this one, see that that's the header, and use that for B. So we should actually double check that we want 60 skips total. What does this come out to? 60. Perfect. OK, so let's try that again. So B seems to have been read in properly. If we say view B, there it is. OK. How many more blocks do we have in this? There's like six blocks. Um, whenever you find yourself repeating something but making slight changes each time, what did I suggest that you might try to do? Try to make a function. Okay. So we have to figure out a way to make a function that generalizes across the different blocks. So we can say read in block one, read in block two, and it figures out basically how to just change this single thing. All right, so we'll create a function. Um, read a block. Block to read. And I'll make this bigger. Equals function. <coughs> um, oh, sorry. Yeah, this part. So I'm creating an object that is a function. So I have to, I was thinking in another language. I was thinking in Python for a second. Um, so read, the, read a block is going to become a function. And the function has one argument, block to read. So we can copy what we have up here for the um, reading in the file is the thing we're going to do. And we need to somehow use block to read in here. So instead of skipping, well, we definitely want four, because four is in both of them. So it'd be four plus something. All right. Um, well, here it was four plus zero. So, and here it was four plus uh, 56. So how would I make it so that when block to read is 1, this says 4 plus 0. And when block to read is 2, this says 56. When block to read is 3, it would say 2 times 56. Make a vector of block over 56. Don't need to make a vector. We just, so we're just going to, so this is. Like block to read minus 1. That's, yes, that's it. So, I, I didn't know if you could just yeah. literally type that in. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so notice that when block to read is 1, this evaluates to 1 minus 1, which is 0. So it doesn't matter what this chunk is. So it's just going to be 4. When block to read is 2, this is going to evaluate to 1. So 1 times 56, it's going to be 4 plus 56, etc. for the rest of the blocks to read. So we can say read a block. I'll define that function, and then I'll use it. So a equals read a block 1. And it read nicely. If I say view a, should be the same as what we had before, 1 through 48. If I say b, 
equals rate of block two. And I'll say view B. There's number two. I'll say C equals read uh, block three. View C. Now I could keep doing this, but again, I'm doing something repetitive. Um, it would be cleaner and easier to catch errors if I instead made a function to do this bit. Well, actually, we've already encountered what we want to do when we want to just repeat a function with a different input every time. Do you guys remember what that was? Used it. Last time we needed to repeat a function which was just read TSV and we had a different file every time we wanted to read TSV. If you remember what function we used to... We had a whole bunch of files. Each one we want to read TSV and we want to just do all that at once without map having... DF. Map DF. So the map is the thing that tells it to do this call some function many times with a different value for its first argument each time, and the df part means that it ensures that everything gets combined together as a data frame. So, so I could, I'm just going to overwrite a. So we'll use mapdf.x is just the list of blocks that we would want, 1 through 6. And dot f is our function that we just created. Read a block. So if I look at that, that creates an object called a. It's all read in correctly. View a. And now we'll see that it's got the first block, second block, third block, fourth block, fifth block, sixth block. So we had to do a little bit more to read a single person's file, but you can put together the pieces of things that you've already been shown um, to get around the troublesome part of these data. Any questions on? Just a refresher, the dot x, just, that can be a list or anything you want yeah. to yeah, it's usually a vector. Um, for each element in that vector, um, is a, it will run the function, passing that element's value as the value for that function's first argument. So first time it runs through, it's grabbing the 1 and saying read a block 1. Second time, read a block 2, etc. Um, so that's for one person's file. But if we look in this folder, there's lots of people. Any ideas how we would go about making it so that... Can you do a map DF or a map DF? Yeah. <laughs> yep. So we'd want to put map DF inside a function. We could have, I guess... We can nest it, but I don't want to get into nesting. Let's actually be explicit and make a function. So read all blocks is going to be a function. So what is the argument to this function? What is it the thing that's going to be common across calls to mapdf? Well, it's going to read a block. It's going to, we're going to paste this in. So I'll paste it in right now. Um, but we actually will have to modify this read a block part two. Because what is this read a block going to do? It's only opening the one file. It's only ever going to refer to this file. So, 
we should give it a um, second argument. Or actually, so I'll take that off. I'll just give it a second argument called file, which then, so read a block takes an argument called file. Whatever value it gets for that, it's going to pass it along to read TSV. So that means whenever we've got read a block here, we'd have to say file equals that one, file equals that one. And I'm really bothering to enter this simply because I, if you guys look at this code and look back, I'd want this to actually work. So now if we, I can triple check that this works. So run this to redefine read a block and make sure that actually works. So yeah, that grabs that first first block of entries for that file. We could enter a different file. So I'll read file equals number 10. And that would be person number 10. OK, so we've modified our read a block so it accepts a file argument. Um, We'd have to, if we were just sticking with the, okay, trying to read a block for a single person, map df, it needs two arguments, the list you want to iterate over and the function you want to apply to each element in that list. Um, it's going to fill whatever the first argument to this function with the each element of this as it iterates over them. But you can tell it uh, what you want as any of the other arguments to this that then don't vary across iterations as it iterates. So the first time it runs through, it's going to say read a block, um, pass one for the first argument, and then add file equals that as the second argument. And the second time through, it's going to add two as the first argument, and file equals that as the second argument. So this should still work. Get all one through whatever, one through six. So now, if we want a function that reads all blocks from a given file, we can say mapdf.f, or sorry, file equals. So, so we've got a single function now. Instead of having to. Um, if we all we cared about was reading in a single file, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to make this as a separate function. Um, it's maybe a little no, it's no no more no less typing. It's more typing. So this we could use it to just say a equals read all blocks and file equals that. Put it on different lines so we can see it a little easier. But all this amount of code isn't much shorter. It's indeed, it's longer than doing this. But the benefit is that if we want to read multiple blocks, we'd map df on this function, passing a list of files to iterate over. So, overwrite a yet again, map df. We'll have something called dot x and dot f. The dot f is read all blocks. And the dot x should be a call to list.files. Remember we used that the other day to figure out all the files in a um, folder. So the path, we have to say data because it's in a folder called data. And we wanted to, to say, we learned the other day that we have to say for this full.names argument, we want it to be true so that it returns. Let me actually, I'm just going to select this little bit and run it just to double check that it's grabbing the full path to each of these files. So yeah, it is. So I should be able to run this. Oh, read all blocks not found. I didn't run this, but
All right, so for each chunk, that's, we're going to get lots of output there. That's OK. Um, we'll now say view A. And it's got person 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Person 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's got all the people. It's got 5,800 rows. 20 people? Should be, yeah. So it wasn't too much code to figure out. It was just putting together some of the tools that you guys have already been shown, um, possibly in novel ways that you hadn't thought about before. Um, but also a lesson in making sure your experiments spit out nice data so that you don't have to bother with all this. You can just use the single map DF on read TSV or read CSV and be done with it. Um, okay, uh, I did want to show you another quick trick using the, let's see, I'm going to say start a new session, so I'm going to save this, and I guess I'll close, sure, start up our studio again, we're going to use that ant3 folder this time. Again, there's no, um, or I'll say, new project. Existing directory, and I'll go find that ants3 folder teaching. Come on. 6001, ant3, open. Create project. Okay, so um, got a project started. We'll start up a new script, new file, our script, um, and I'll immediately save ant three analysis. Okay, so we'll typically be immediately or using most of the tidyverse stuff, so I'll put that in. And I want to work with this ant wide data set. So I'll click on it just to view it down here. It's actually not going to view very nicely in this. Um, I'm going to open up another. Do I have Text Wrangler on here? No, I don't. Uh, what can I view it in? Give you. Second. There we go. Okay, so this is a different text editor that just happens to have the feature that um, it doesn't. It allows you to toggle whether it's called wrapped or uh, not wrapped. So it allows like the text to go to the right off the screen, whereas the viewer in our studio, if it's text, you don't have the option of not wrapping it. I don't think so. No. Okay, so the way this file is structured, um, it seems to be tab delimited. It's a single tab character. It's got a header um, and lots and lots of columns. Okay, so let's read this in in the first place. Uh, I said it was tab delimited, so we probably want to use read TSV. I put in an object called A. Reader read TSV file equals it's not in any folder or anything, so I could just type ant wide dot txt and actually that should be fine. All right, so I've read it in. Let's make sure it looks okay. Yeah, it's got the headers there, and it's got all those numbers, all those columns. So this is a format that you might see if somebody's done maybe some pre-processing to the data. Um, I get this a lot from people who have already done some processing and then imported it into SPSS because SPSS likes this format where there's, if you notice the subnum column, that's indicating the subject number or participant number. 
So each person has just one row. Um, that's the format that SPSS tends to like. So if you've got colleagues using SPSS, they might have already pre-formatted the data for SPSS. Um, this is called wide data format when a single sort of unit of observation has just one row and the observations are spread across columns. Uh, for most of what we're going to do, uh, we want it in a different format called long format, uh, where there's one sort of observation per row, but the same person can have multiple rows. So you can actually get a sense as to that there's different um, like variables in that these columns are split into. Um, so RT is at the beginning of all of them, so that's not super helpful or distinguishing. But you'll notice this sort of in between the two periods, there's a none here, a center here, a double here, spatial. None, center, double, spatial. And then the last word is either neutral, 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 conger, and conger, and conger, and conger, and conger. So, the way this data set, this is actually the same data set that we were dealing with before with the other ant, um, where there's two variables. One variable has the levels none, center, double, spatial, and then the other variable has the levels congruent, incongruent, and neutral. So, it'd be nice to be able to um, reshape this data set from wide, which um, it came in as, to uh, long. So, uh, I'm just going to bring up my note because I have this kind of already hidden to the side. Read block, read multiple blocks. Aha, okay. All right, so there's a function to uh, reshape from wide to long called gather. So if you imagine you've got lots of columns and you're gathering them together into a single column. The opposite of gather is spread. So if you had a scenario where you needed the data into wide data format, you'd use the um, function spread. Both are from the tidier package, but we're going to use gather. So I'll maybe create a new object, a long equals the result of calling this. So, what are the arguments to gather? Uh, we can look at the help. Uh, so, the tie year gather. First argument's called data. Presumably, that's the data object that we want to reshape. So, data equals A. Second argument, key. Not sure what that is, but I'll Write it down. Key equals something here. Don't know what yet. And the third argument, value, equals something here. Don't know what yet. And then it's got dot, 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 and then some other things. Um, so let's look at these. Key and value. Names of key and value columns to create in output. OK. So we want to take the wide data where it has lots of columns that already have names and kind of combine them so that we've got what's going to happen first is that we're going to take the wide data so that such that it has one two three four what's well, actually I know 12 different columns per person and it's going to split it up so that there's one column so it's going to have a subnum column it's going to have a key column and it's going to have a value column each person is going to have 12 rows. So we need to just choose a name for what the key column is called and what the value column is called. I often just say key and value. Indeed, I wish it had those as defaults so that I didn't need to type those every single time. I don't know why they're not kind of specified as defaults. This dot, dot, dot. It's, it's asking for a list of columns, well, specification of columns to gather. So we've got 12 columns to gather. 
So we could start writing a list of those 12 columns, but that would take a lot of time to write. It just so happens that uh, you can do it two different ways. You can either tell it the names of all the columns to gather. So I'd say art. You don't have to put quotes around it, which is nice. A little bit easier typing. I'd say RT none dot neutral and then RT center dot neutral. That's a lot of typing. I'm not going to do it that way. Another way is to say what columns you don't want gathered, and that's usually the smaller set. So subnum is a column I don't want gathered. So I can say negative subnum. So it's, yeah, it's just the syntax that it uses. If it sees a negative in front of the name of the um, column, it uh, doesn't use that column to gather, but uses everything else. All right. So in theory, if we now view a long, we should have sorted it a little differently than I expected. I thought we'd have 12 rows for the first person and then 12 rows for the second person, etc. But it's actually sorted it by the key. So first we get everybody's entry in the RT none neutral column. And then it repeats the IDs for the RT central neutral, center neutral column. But it's got the structure that we wanted. That is that now we have a single column that has the just the previous column names and a single column that has all the values that was in this. If you want to take out more columns than just subnum, would you just put a comma and then... Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So if there were like, if we happen to have another column that um, had, say, the participant's age, we'd say age. Okay. So we've done a little bit to reformat this data, but it's still in this a little bit messy scenario where there were two variables encoding the factor structure in the names of these things, and we're left with just one column. So it'd be nice to be able to like break out these labels, because there's a none there. So you see all these nuns. It'd be nice to have a column that said none, and then center, and then a whole different column that did the neutral congruent and congruent stuff. So um, that's where a new um, function comes, still from tidier, to separate. So I'll look up separate. Gonna need me to do that. No. You search set for it. You set for it. You set you search for it with yeah. Oh. Oh, I that's one of my perennially misspelled words is separate. I have to think about it every time. All right, separate and from tidier. So we're looking at the right thing. It's got data, so presumably we want the thing that we want that contains the data that we want to modify somehow. So what separate's going to do, actually, given a regular expression or a vector of character positions, separate turns a single character column into multiple columns. We're not going to use regular expressions, or I don't think, wait a second. Um, Right, separate is actually smart enough to automatically guess. It actually has a regular expression here. Regular expressions are ways of cutting up strings by matching um, characters. Um, all you need to know is that it, by default, sees that there will be able to see that there's like three entries here separated by a um, a dot, a period. Um, so, let's see, 
So wait, let me say data equals long. The column that contains the, the strings that we want to separate is in the key column. And we have to name the three columns that it's going to spit out. So that's what the into argument is for. Uh, we can, and to give it the, the three names, we have to create a vector that has the three names. So the first column is just going to be RT, because that's what's in that. Or we can even call it uh, junk or whatever, because it doesn't actually encode a variable. It's just the letters RT for everything. Um, the next one, call it a variable called Q. And next one is flankers. And I know those names because I made the data set. And that's what I, as the designer, would have expected for those columns. Um, and let's sort it into, uh, let's overwrite a long. So now if we view a long again, now we, it's actually taken out that, uh, combined column and replaced it with the three columns that we just asked it to create. And so now the two thing, the thing that we're most interested, which is these two columns, they're actually separated now into two different variables. Thus completing our conversion from this wide format to a long format. So can I just ask a question about clarification? So the, the point of doing that is that now you can run analyses on either the queue or the flanker or combine them so you can yeah. get interactions or whatever. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Most of the analytic tools that we'll be using um, and graphing tools and things work best with long format data. Um, I wanted to show you this as an example of how to get to long format if somebody's given you wide format data. Most of the time, data like has to be pre-processed to get into wide format. Most of the time, our collection apparatuses uh, tend to uh, yield wide format because it just writes out an observation as it gets it, so they naturally get separate lines. Um, but sometimes somebody has given you data that's already been wideified. Question there? Uh, if um, uh, the uh, names of those columns were uh, the RT spatial separated by underscores instead of dots, for example, would the um, would whatever our most recent function still sort of be smart enough to acknowledge? I'm pretty sure. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, that would it figure I'm pretty out? sure it's smart enough okay. to figure out, like, what is the repeating character that separates. It also, because you're giving it a character vector called into that names the columns that you're expecting out. Um, okay. It knows how many entries to expect okay. to separate by. So if you give it something of length three here, it expects two sort of um, separating character strings here. So um, it's pretty smart, I believe. And um, you, uh, if you go to the A1 tab, you said you originally expected it to sort of be set up as like subject, it would be all the data from subject one, then two, is there a way to make it? Yes, that? that's what we're getting into next. Oh, okay. Yep, so data wrangling. So you've got your data in, but you need to do some reformatting. So reshaping, that's kind of in the domain of data wrangling. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other things that you might want to do. Um, I'm going to save, I'm going to close or start a new session because this new session is not going to use any uh, data that I've given you. It's going to follow pretty closely to the R for Data Science data wrangling chapter. Um, let me bring up my, I just want to double check that I'm not forgetting anything. Nope. All right. So um, I'm going to start a new R Studio session and not bother creating a project. There we go. Um, 
But I am going to open up a script to start working on, working from. I'm going to use the tidyverse. And there's that package that I started using the other day very briefly, NYC flights. And that's just because this NYC flights package um, provides a data set called flights that's really big. And there's a lot, there's, there's a bunch of interesting things one could deal, do with it. So let's actually run this bit. And what is in the flights data set? So it's got 300,000 entries across 19 columns. So this is, um, if I actually do a question mark flights, will it actually give me help on what this is? OK, on time data for all flights that departed New York in 2013. So lots of flight data. Um, and it's just a big data set to illustrate um, some tools that I'll show you to uh, achieve various reformatting jobs that one might want um, when preparing for an analysis. So um, the tools are all coming from the dplyr package. And there's going to be um, a range, which is for uh, ordering rows. Yeah, I should do this all as comments, otherwise it's going to auto-complete as I go. Uh, there's going to be filter for selecting rows. It's going to be select for um, selecting columns. Uh, well, you can also order selecting order columns. Uh, what else? Uh, mutate, which is creating new columns. Summarize. It accepts both English and uh, American spellings uh, for um, collapsing rows by some computation. So a mean, for example, would collapse a bunch of rows into its mean. And kind of a helper for summarize, or something that's going to make summarize very useful, is group by, which allows you to specify sets of rows to collapse over. All right, so we'll walk through these. So they all take the, um, like many of the tidyverse functions, they take the format where you have a function, I'll just call it f, um, and the first argument is called data, and the second, the main, remaining arguments are uh, tailor what the function is going to do. So we're going to use the NYC flights, and let's use uh, the arrange. Did I, do I really want to do arrange first? For some reason, I have it second in my... All right, let's... Stick with the code that I have. So let's do do filter first. So selecting rows. Um, so filter, and I'm not going to assign. As we go through here, I'm not going to. I'm just going to run the functions so that they print out like the dplyr summary to the screen. I'm not going to assign the result into an object, but of course you could, if you want, and you would if you want to do actual computations on things. I'm just going to show each function and how it works. Um, so data equals flights. And the way filter works is that um, all the subsequent arguments are logical expressions um, that it's going to apply to each row. 
So if I want to, say, look in the months column, let's see, look in the month column, and if it's one, keep it. Otherwise, toss it. I would say month equals one. So let's see. Started out with a table with 336,000 entries, uh, months. Uh, what did I do wrong? Flights. Yeah. On the left there, that's like the summary of the data, but you're editing kind of within the actual full set right now, right? So you're selecting. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, the view we see is just a subset of the view, but the function will apply to the whole thing. Aha! I know what's gone awry. Uh, it's again the reason why you should always put the function that you want because it was calling a different filter. Oh, that's right, that was one of the. That's, two. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, month is not in flights. Is month not in flights? It is in flights. I'm going to kick my. So, this is one of these scenarios where. Um, I'm sure the issue is that I'm doing something wrong. Filter, flights, months. Uh, I think I remember now. Um, yep. <laughs> yep. That's a little bit annoying. There's a little bit of inconsistency. So we were just dealing with one, what was it? Uh, T the tidier package, all the functions expect the first argument to be named data, whereas mm -hmm. dplyr, written by the same author, um, expects all the first or all the first arguments are named dot data. This is one where most people didn't explicitly write out. Yeah, data. in fact, we are going to hopefully by the end of the class, <laughs> uh, at least, yeah, learn a tool that allows us to not need to worry about that specific naming and consistency. The fact that it exists is still a little bit irksome, but okay. Especially since it's the same person. <laughs> exactly. All right, so if we say filter month equals one, we now have many fewer rows. Kind of have to trust that it's collapsed down to just that month. Um, we could do a tape, we could store the result and do a table and ask like what entries are in the month column, um, but for now, just trust me. Similarly, if we wanted to say only the first month and the first day, we could do it like that. We just add a new argument. And any of the logicals that are expressed here get anded together. So if you want to add more selectors, uh, they'll just combine. So with just month one, it came down to 27,000. And with just day one and month one, so that's January 1st flights, there was 842 flights on January 1st. You could have done this a slightly different way. And I'll show you. So instead of having month equal equals one as one argument and day equals equals one as another argument, let's actually put this in parentheses. I guess I don't need the space there. Um, put this in parentheses. And instead of having it as a separate argument, put an and there. That's what I mean. The separate arguments are anded together. They it's because it's equivalent to this. You probably wouldn't want to do this. I mean, this is already more typing than the first way I showed you. The reason why I'm showing you it is if you wanted not an and, but an or, you'd have to put it on the same line. So this would grab all the days in January or um, it, it will 
grab the row if either of these things are true. So is it January or is it the first day of the month? It's a weird selection to have, but uh, that would get you... So if you happen to have a requirement for subsetting your data across rows such that you wanted an OR to be achieved, you have to put it on the same line. Well, can you put it one line down to start with the OR symbol? No, because, well, yes, yeah. Oh, if you wanted it visually, yeah, you can do it that way. So that kind of maintains this nice visual for your code, I think. Yep. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Uh, do you have to... You have to use that symbol or can you type more? You have to use that symbol. So that's the below your delete key, maybe? Shift yeah. and backslash. Yeah. All right, so that's if you want to do an or. Um, you can also use, so if we wanted, I'm going to copy this. Go down. If we wanted to say um, month equals one or month equals two or I wanted the first three months, first quarter. You could do it that way. So this would cut down to January, February, March, 80,000 rows-ish. Um, but there's a slightly faster typing-wise way of doing it, which I'll show you. Instead of saying it's either of those, you can say month and percent sign in percent sign. Month in one through three. And that grabs the same set of rows. If you wanted like every other month, you'd say month in 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, for example. But yeah, if you have like a set of months, instead of doing like the or with every single month in there, uh, you can just check if the month is in some list. Yeah, it's not creating a new data file, but a new data set yeah. in memory, such that if you want to like ignore some set of rows, this filters out those set of rows and keeps only the set of rows that you're interested in. So often in my experiments, I have a whole set of row, uh, I have a whole chunk of rows that are practice for the participant. They're playing a video game, they get a couple minutes of practice ahead of time. So I want to get rid of all the rows for which the entry in the block column is practice. So I usually toss those trials. Um, ba -ba -ba. So the only other thing I want to talk about in terms of filtering is that sometimes, so you're filtering by a logical statement and whenever it returns true, it's kept, but sometimes you can have missing data. And remember I talked about it the other day, NA is the way um, missing data is labeled in R. So there actually is one of these columns has missing data, the depth time. Because so, this um, data set flights includes um, flights that were canceled. So there's a function to filter out. So if you want to say filter out all the canceled flights. Uh, well we need a function to ask is depth time NA? Maybe we do that. Um, let's try that. But you're trying to get rid of those, right? Right, so maybe I'll say depth oh. time not equals NA. Oh, okay. Yeah. So let's try that. It's a table with zero entries. So does that mean that all the entries in depth time were NA? No, because look, there's a 517. Those aren't NAs. Something's gone awry here. 
what's happened is that this expression, let's actually test something. Let's say true equals NA. Or NA equals NA. So you can't include NA in a logical comparison because the result is NA. Um, you can imagine NA, whenever you see an NA, replace it with I don't know. So is true equal to I don't know? I don't know. It could be. Is true equal to the thing I have in this box? Well, maybe. Uh, is the thing I have in this box the same as the thing I have in this other box? Maybe. So uh, you can't do explicit logical comparisons with NA. Um, you have to use a function called is.na. So this will, just pick the that NA, will just right? pick the NA. So actually, let's run it, and we should be able to see that the dep time column should be all NAs for this one. Da, da, da. Uh, should be 8,000 NAs. Ish in the whole data set. Yeah. Yep. So if we don't want it to be NA, we just put an exclamation mark at the front. So at the is dot, it's looking for the string of characters from within the data. Yeah, it looks in that column and it just looks to see if it's that special NA entry in that column. So now, by putting an exclamation mark, we've said toss all the NAs. Toss all the columns in flights for which the entry in the depth time column is NA. OK, so that's uh, filtering rows, getting rid of rows, or keeping a subset of the rows. How about just sorting the rows? That's arrange. So dplyr arrange dot data equals flights and what do you think the rest of the arguments should be if we want to arrange the rows of a data set okay well we're giving it the data set we want to arrange what should the argument other arguments maybe be Well, we, in theory, want to arrange all the rows, sort all the rows by what? So we give it the arguments that we want it to sort by? OK. Alphabetical? Or... Uh, ID? Uh, Would you, do you just give it the explicit order you want it sorted by? OK, order of what? Of the, the rows. OK, but the rows have lots of information on each row. Let's say month. Okay, you have to give it the column names, yeah. Okay, so we want to sort the rows by columns. So we just give it the set of columns we want to sort by. Um, so if we wanted it to be like year, sort by year first, month next. So it's going to sort by year, and then any ties get sorted by month, and any ties remaining there get sorted by day. I think that's actually how it's already arranged, so that might not be super different looking. Let's see. Yeah, no. Huh. Um, if we wanted to reverse the ordering, so it's all one year, so let's put um, desk means sort descending. So now it's starting with the 12th month. Um, if you have NAs, the NAs are always going to be at the end. So it's probably a good idea to always filter first and then arrange so that you get rid of NAs that, that you know about. When you sorted that column, is it just the column that changed or anything else, or all the rows changed? All the rows. So I say sort all the rows by these columns. So for each row, it looks what's in the year column. It puts all the 2013. I think there's actually a couple 2014 in this data set. Um, let me say table lights year. 
No, nope, they're all 2013. So that's a useless column to sort by. Okay. So it looks at the month. So having deleted year there, it looks at the month's column, and it sorts them in descending order, as written right now. Um, it then looks in the days column. If there's any ties, so for all the month 12s, it then looks in the day column and sorts that set of rows okay, by so day. It's not like switching up the, the data for the digits. No, no, okay. no, no. It's maintaining like the, the all the information per row. It's just reordering where okay. the rows are. Yeah. Yeah. So if we still had the uh, the NAs in there, they would just be up block at the very bottom. Yeah, exactly. So okay. if you if one of the say month we somehow lost data for what month a certain flight was on, they'd be a big block at the bottom okay. with NAs. Okay, cool. We still try to sort by the other ones within right. that block if there's not NAs there. Whatever is like news that has multiple say um, overlaps Yeah, yeah. Um, ba -ba -ba. So arrange. I don't really use arrange that much because I don't like look at my data set that often. Um, I guess if you're going to do some... <laughs> I guess if you're going to do some like time series stuff where you start wanting to do some computations like, okay, keep a running tally of something through the day, then you'd want to make sure something was sorted first and then you do your computation. I don't typically use arrange that much though. What if you have match participants? Do you have to arrange that? Uh, so all the tools that we're going to use don't really assume, don't really need an ordering. Um, so, so like with most functions that you'd specify, yeah. you're selecting. Yeah, exactly. Things, so. Yeah. So, Another function we'll talk about is select. It again takes uh, first argument is data. And select is for choosing a subset of columns to keep and a subset of columns to toss. Again, usually I don't use this very much because um, as you'll see later, it doesn't cost a lot to have all your columns still just stay there. Um, so only if you're ever going to just like try to look at your data um, would you ever bother with select. As we'll see in a moment, select can also just reorder the set of columns, which again is only useful for looking at it like as a human. Um, but the way select works in the same way as both arrange and filter work, um, you, well, for select, you just tell it what columns you want to keep. So if I just want the year column, I put year. If I want year month, it keeps all the rows, but it is tossing the columns that are not talked about. Um, if I wanted to explicitly just take off the year column, because it actually is very useless, you put the negative in front and say, and that it is able to figure out that you that you don't want year, but you want all the rest of them. Um, you know, other cool things, like if I know that it goes year, month, day, and I just want year, month, day, I don't have to say year, month, day instead I can say year colon day and it's able to figure out that there's a sequence it's from the year colon year column to the day column keep um, you can also so that's sort of a destructive select you can also have it as just a reordering select by Say I wanted it day, month, year. Day, month. Actually, let's see. I, I don't know. If I want a day to year, will it go backwards? Yeah, it goes backwards. But say I still want all the other columns there. I just wanted to reorder those three columns and put them at, at the front. You can add in 
call to the everything function, uh, which I guess if I want to say, so the everything function uh, will tell select that I want day, month, year, and then all the rest of the columns. So this is the way of having a just a reordering version of select. So it still has all the other columns, but it's reordered such that the first three are day, month, year. You don't have to put anything in the function that's like, nope. like quit or something like that. Exactly. No, nope. it just this really just triggers select to behave a little differently. So you don't have to put anything in here? Yeah, no. Nope. I mean it's everything, you know. What yeah. Else, what else could you add? Um, in the same way, I guess the, the other example I have here, in the same way that you can, um, I told you you can tell it to just take off year if you want to, again, say, take off a whole sequence of columns. So those columns year through day, it would do that. So year, month, day are gone now. Um, there's, you should look at the chapter, there's a bunch of um, helper functions with select. Um, I guess this is particularly useful when you're dealing with huge data sets where there's like hundreds of columns or whatever. Um, and you can refer to the columns by name or by um, using string parsing uh, functions. So let's see. Starts, actually, better. So th there's a starts with function. So if it starts with, let's go with uh, A. Actually, I have to put that in quotes, A. So that's going to keep all the columns that start with the letter A. I could have put that um, as... ARR, so a longer string, and that's just going to grab the two, the arrival time, arrival delay. You can do an ends with. So I could talk about delay, and it grabs the departure delay and arrival delay. Um, there's a contains. Uh, so let's grab all the ones that contain an underscore. There's a bunch of them. Six of them that have an underscore. There's a matches that expects that you know of regular expressions, which I don't, so we're not going to use. Um, num range might be useful sometimes because it says it expects that there's some. Uh, well, we're never going to get into it, but if you want to look at num range, it's in the R for data science. I'm not going to cover it. Uh, all right, so that's select. You can select by like, you can use these helper functions to match the strings, the names of the columns, um, instead of having to type them in and figure them out yourself. So we're going to get into um, modifying uh, the data set. One modification, you could, uh, other than like trimming and reordering, uh, one thing you can do is dplyr rename. That's going to take data as the argument. But this is going to rename columns. So maybe you don't like the name of a column that, uh, so if you say the original name was tail num, let's see, is that in there? Six more variables. Oh, I think I always get renamed backwards. The example he has, I, in the flights data set, there's, one, there's a column called tail num with no underscore. So, and if we wanted to rename it so that it did have an underscore, we'd run it this way. I always forget 
which one is which, like the new one on the left of the equals or the new one on the right of the equals? Just, wouldn't it do the exact same thing if you just like select in the like flight dollar sign till not and reassign it to a new column name? Ah, so you're, you're using the dollar sign yeah. uh, approach to things, <laughs> and that, uh, it's good that you know that. Um, the tidyverse and dplyr stuff obviates the need to oh, do okay. that. This is the other way of doing it. Um, but yes, that is one a different way. You just know your direction a little bit yeah. that way. Yeah. It's obvious what you're reading. Yes, no, I agree with that. That's it. That is more explicit. But you can't use like a little assignment arrow that is synonymous with equals sign. I don't think so. No, let's. Even if you do, is it still sort of like which contains which? If you did it that way, let's actually see. No, it's oh, uh, colon colon. Yeah, there. So yeah, it's not a. So yeah, this creates a new thing where we should have something called tail num underscore num now. And before it was just tail num. Yeah, I always get it. I'm always uncertain as to what one goes on the left and what one goes on the right. Um, but the new one goes on the left and the old one goes on the right. Kind of makes sense. You're always creating a new object when it's on the left um, of an equal sign. So that's just overwriting the name. And you could do that for a bunch of columns if you want to rename a bunch of columns at the same time. Um, let's see. Do I need to do this? I guess. So I've got a little bit of code here. Um, yeah, I'll just. Uh, so if you want to add a new column, use dplyr mutate. Uh, first argument is the name of the data set you're working with. The next argument is the name of a new column that you want to create. So um, if you want to talk about um, time gain, it would be the arrival delay minus the departure delay. Speed would be, and I'm referring, arrival delay and departure delay are existing um, columns there. Speed would be distance divided by error time. And if I want, so the nice thing about, so we can, let me actually just run this a little bit. Notice it's the same number of rows. We haven't done anything different about rows. 21 columns now, so the original was 19. It's added those two columns to the end. If I just wanted those two columns, I didn't want any of the original, instead of mutate, I'd say transmute. And it just gives me those two columns. I don't think I've ever used transmute. I'm going to create it back to mutate. Um, a really nice thing about the uh, mutate is that it allows you to refer to columns that you just created. So if I wanted to create a weird thing that was some combination of these two, um, let's go gain div speed equals time gain divided by speed. It will go through and it will compute this column, compute this column, and then when it gets to the job of computing the, this column, it has already made these two columns so it can actually do its computation. If I put this at the very beginning, um, I don't know, it might be smart enough to work. No. You have to put it at the end because it has to, it, it will, I guess, do them in order. It computes, it creates this column, then creates the next column, which finally means that this one is allowed to run because it refers to those two columns. So you can create a bunch of columns at once. Each one is just sort of a computation of the existing columns. 
Um, it's sometimes useful for, I don't know, computing some derived property from your um, data set. Um, much more useful is when you want to create a summary of your data set. So, uh, dplyr, whoops, summarize, dot data equals flights. In the summary we're going to create, well, the second argument to summary is the name of a new column you're going to create. So I'll call it uh, mean delay equals mean of depth delay. So I want to create a mean of the depth delay column. Summarize. It's going to yield a table. The table is going to have, it's going to be one by one, one column, one row. Something's gone wrong here, awry here. I wanted to look at the delay column and get a mean. But it's NA. I have a guess as to why. Does it, for canceled flights, does it have a delay of it, NA? Yeah. And that's why I'm up. Yep. Okay, so canceled flights have a delay. So we need to do something to fix that. Um, we could first create flights no NA equals and what dplyr function would we use? Uh, sorry, yes, you said filter. Yeah, and so that is correct. So data equals flights. And do we remember what we would want here as the selector? So we want to use is dot exclamation is dot na and depth delay. So this will create a new object flights no na that we then could summarize. Yay, it actually gives me a result, so average of 12, 13 minute departure delay in this data set for those flights that did actually depart. Um, in the book, it, said, it gives you a, the option to use flights, but there's actually an argument to mean that um, na.rm equals true that will toss all the NAs that yeah. it encounters. Dot RM is removed, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So remove it. I would suggest that doing it this way, filtering explicitly in your code and not relying... It's a little bit more upfront about, yes, I realize there's NAs here, therefore I'm going to filter them before I summarize them. Um, whereas relying on this NA.RM equals true, adding that in, um, it's less obvious what's going on to your reader, which might be you months down the line. Earlier we used like the minus sign to say everything but that. And how's that different from the exclamation point? Like more complex? The minus sign is for... Uh, so the filter expects logical statements. Select, which we could use a minus sign with, it's just expecting the specification of a column. Minus is not going to work as a logical. Let's triple check. Ah, filter condition does not evaluate to a logical vector because with this becomes a logical, but then when we say minus, it tries to do math on it or it turns it into a negative number. So it's like negative one and zeros. So what if we use the player's select function? Well, select selects columns. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. filter selects rows. Yeah. Um, ba -ba -ba. So summarize so far isn't super useful. Like you can collapse the entire set of rows to a single value. And what you put in summarize determines how, like, what is computed to that single value. Um, much summarize is made much more useful 
So I'm going to revert it to using flights.na before I forget. And I'll take off the NARM because it's not needed anymore. So run this again, just showing you. Oh, what happened there? Uh, oh, I took off the not by mistake. Again, gets back to that single value. Um, summarize can become much more useful when we combine it with group by. So we've created this flights no na object. Uh, let's create yet another object with a really long name. dplyr group by. So dplyr group by takes an argument called data. We'll give it the flights no na. And the other argument is, or other arguments, um, are variables that we want to imply a group for any subsequent calls to summarize. <coughs> so let's say month. So I'm going to run that. Now, notice this is what flights no NA looks like. 328, 521 by 19, and this is what grouped by month looks like, 328, 521 by 19. Um, so they have the same, nothing's changed about like the data underlying it. The only thing that's even changed about this visual is now we get this extra little line here. It says groups month. It's telling you how many groups there are. So it's saying there's 12 unique values in the month column. And it's keeping that sort of it's remembering that we want to do any subsequent summaries separately on each of those groups. So let's do a summary. Copy our summarize here. Put it down here. And instead of flights no NA, we'll say flights no NA grouped by month. And now, instead of a single value out for the mean, in that mean delay column, we get a value for every thing that we grouped by. What if we copy this all? I'm going to paste it down below. Yes. Month and day. Implying that I want to put day in there as well. So grouping by month and day. So this little bit will create the object. I'll then run the summary, summary on it. And now there's going to be 365 entries in this. One day uh, for every set of days and months, every combination of day and month there's going to mean delay for that day. So you can group by an arbitrary number of variables to then do a summary for each unique combination of those variables. Why does it have a question mark after month? Um, I've, I've, no, I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry? Ah, well this, so, this is a bit of a more nuanced thing here. Uh, we have asked it, so if I look at this object, flight, no NA, group by month and day, that will have groups, month, day. And it says there's 365 unique combinations of month and day. Um, this will create a new tibble, which represents the summary that we want applied to each unique combination. It also keeps the grouping that we asked for before, but removes the, I guess, whatever is the lowest down the, uh, we put here. It removes that because you can't 
do any computations that's unique now. So if we want to then, after doing this, store it to an object. So let's, I'm getting lazy, so I'm going to call it A. Now if I want to do another summary, uh, and say A, and I don't know, let's get the variance. Uh, bar cross days equals bar mean delay. Is that gone? OK. So I'll run this. It's going to create an object called A, which contains this table that has three columns, 365 entries. Um, it already has a grouping on it left over from when we did this grouping. This grouping did the original data set by month and day. We then summarized. That creates this new object. And it's maintained some of the grouping from the original one, such that it's now still grouping by month, but not grouping by day. So now if we run a summary, it, that shows that it was still grouping by month and that we actually have a column here called month. And we're getting an entry for that where it's computed for each month the variance across the various days mean delay. Not sure that's super useful. Um, well, it actually, there's quite a bit of variability across months. So November, there's a pretty consistent amount of delay, whereas in June, there's a ver uh, wide variety of delays across different days. Sorry, I didn't follow your response to the question about how the grouping is changing and why we're getting these two different things. So the, whenever you do a grouping, it is a way of telling, summarize sets to apply the summary to that you're asking for. Um, every time you, I mean, a good procedure is that uh, whenever you do a summary, if you're going to do a summary on the result of the summary, always make sure you're doing a new, like applying the next grouping explicitly. Um, it was just noticed that there already was a grouping still sort of remaining on the object that we got out of that first summary. Um, and that's because the people that designed this wanted people to be able to assume that the summary removes one level of the grouping but maintains the earlier levels. So it's removed the day level of grouping once it's done the summary but we could still do another summary immediately after, and it's maintained that month level of grouping. The better way to do things, I would say, would be to be explicit and say, OK, um, B equals D plier group by, and then dot data equals A, the result of this summary. And the grouping will just be explicit and say month. And there. So it's more typing, um, but it's more explicit. Yeah. So that's the dplyr suite. Um, I'll show you next time the, a last little tool that's come with dplyr. Um, that has, in addition to the dplyr suite of things, has made um, a big splash in the data analysis world uh, for making just this job of data wrangling where you're just kind of preparing the data set um, much easier um, to do. So we'll cover that next time. Oh, question? question? Yeah, you see how like this is great for analysis. Do people ever try to like cheat and just do a lot of this stuff visually in Excel and then put that into like a CSV and then put that into R. Oh yeah, if you if, yeah, if if you want more work for yourself, yeah. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, so the, the way the learning curve works is it looks daunting at first, but once you create like a couple scripts like this, you can obviously just copy and paste the code, and that's a lot less dangerous than copying and pasting the data or doing that sort of thing going from one system to another. So, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Alrighty.